Chapter six, the creator orientation. Did Ted know that I already knew the opposite of victim is creator? That insight had reverberated within me just yesterday as I sat on the bench praying for answers. Those words had burned themselves into my mind only moments before I discovered Ted sitting beside me. Probably just a coincidence. The change Ted is pointing to, moving from victim to creator, is a fundamental shift of mind, Sophia said. To explain, let me share just a bit more about what happened in my marriage to Dan. As our relationship headed into a downward spiral, I began to feel as if nothing I did was ever enough. I had quit my dance class, which I really loved, to spend more time with him. But then he objected when I brought work home or relaxed with a book. He wanted more attention than I could give, I guess. It turned out that the way I naturally behaved in our relationship just wasn't what he wanted or needed. I was despondent about the whole situation. The day I came to sit on that bench, I was trying to get a handle on my life and my future direction. Sophia paused and looked out at the rolling waves, reliving the moment. Once I met up with Ted and we began talking about the DDT, she continued, I saw how deeply I believed I wasn't enough, cycling through the DDT and victim orientation over and over again reinforced this belief for me. Now this is where the creator part comes in. Ted helped me to see that whatever I hold in my mind tends to manifest itself in my life. What we believe and assume creates most of our reality and our experience. I'll bet you and Ted talked about some of your core beliefs yesterday. Yes, I said. Yesterday I came face to face with an old belief of mine that I'm a problem and that people will always abandon me. I'm pretty sure I know when it all started. Smiling, Sophia listened for a few minutes as I described the situations that I believed had led to my clingy fear of abandonment, my pattern of lashing out, even my persistent weight challenge. After a little while, Sophia put one hand up, signaling she'd heard enough. I don't mean to be rude, David, but you know what? It's not so important to me to hear the stories of your past. I'm much more interested in thinking about the new stories you're going to create when you begin using what Ted's going to show you today. Once you have this knowledge, life will never look the same to you again. Tomorrow will be like a fresh canvas on which you'll paint your unique contribution to the world. I turned toward Ted. He reached out toward my journal, which I held in my hand. May I? He asked. There's another orientation I'd like to draw. Let's walk back up to the rocks where we were yesterday. Are you going to toss me another Fisbee? I grinned. Ted laughed. Yes, but it's miles apart from yesterday's Fisbee. It has a different focus, a much different inner state, and leads to a whole new set of behaviors. The three of us settled comfortably on the rocks near the bluff. Ted opened the journal and turned to the page next to the one on which he had drawn the Fisbee and victim orientation the day before, and he drew yet another set of three circles. The focus in the creator orientation is on a vision or an outcome. You orient your thoughts and actions toward creating what you most want to see or experience in life. Sometimes the vision or outcome may be completely clear to you. At other times, it may be vague, only a general idea about where you want to go. As he spoke, Ted wrote vision and outcome in the top circle of the Fisbee. For the first few months after I met Ted, Sophia interjected, my vision was solely to live each day from the standpoint of the creator orientation. In a practical sense, I didn't really know what this was going to mean. I just knew that it was the direction I wanted for my life. Placing my attention on outcomes rather than on problems has made a world of difference. That one choice has had a powerful impact on every single area of my life. Ted added, one of the fundamental differences between the victim orientation and this one is where you put the focus of your attention, as Sophia mentioned. For victims, the focus is always on what they don't want, the problems that seem constantly to multiply in their lives. They don't want the person, condition, or circumstance they consider to be their persecutor, and they don't want the fear that leads to fight, flee, or freeze reactions either. 
Creators, on the other hand, place their focus on what they do want. Doing this, creators still face and solve problems in the course of creating the outcomes they want, but their focus remains fixed on their ultimate vision. I recalled a quote from the Bible that someone had recently shared with me, something like, where there is no vision, the people perish. As I stood with Ted and Sophia, I felt the importance of this concept. I was quite clear that I didn't want to live from the victim's stance anymore, but I was not yet clear about what I wanted to create. Growing up, I had learned all too well how to focus on problems. It seemed that was always the focus in my family. Not enough money, not enough time, my parents arguing, relatives who were sick or struggling. After a few moments of silence, I looked over at Sophia and Ted. I find that I know all too well what I don't want in my life. I'm not sure how to get clear about what I do want, I said. That is quite often the case when we've been sleepwalking through life in the victim orientation, Sophia responded. When we lack vision for what we want in our lives, seeing only what we don't want. The unique contribution that we're here to offer seems to vanish. In that dark place, we often can't see our way out. We hardly know which way is forward. Those first few months that Ted and I talked, all I could focus on was the creator orientation itself. I also spent quite a bit of time exploring what I most wanted to contribute to others. Later, we can talk more about discerning our life's meaning and purpose. But first, I want Ted to finish outlining the creator orientation. Ted? Thanks, Sophia. I really liked hearing your story, especially what's happening for you in the last couple of years. It makes my heart sing. David, this singing of the heart is the quality of the inner state of the creator orientation. As you focus on your envisioned outcomes, you connect with forgotten or seldom felt emotions, passion, love, a sense of your heart's desire. Ted wrote passion in the center of the second circle in the journal. He said, when you focus on those things in your life that hold meaning and purpose, your passion just naturally flows. Can you remember a time in your life when passion, desire, or love just naturally arose? Sophia asked. I thought for a moment, well, sure, I said. Before my wife and I were married, when we were dating, we spent a lot of time just hanging out together. Back then, I only had to look at her and those feelings just began washing over me. Mm hmm said Ted. You may not want to hear this, David, but that feeling may actually be more related to your experience in the victim orientation than to what we're after here. I would bet the feelings you identified then as love were also the result of your having found your next rescuer. Do you see how that might be possible? I frowned. I felt a tug at the pit of my stomach. Uh, yeah, I guess so. But being in a re relationship is what I really wanted, Sophia added. David, Ted's making an important point. Of course you wanted a relationship. People naturally seek out intimate relationships. But wanting a relationship to chase away your loneliness is very different from consciously envisioning the qualities and characteristics of the kind of person with whom you want to create a partnership. In my own case, as I approached dating from the creator orientation, after many, many months of healing after my divorce, I became much more discerning. I spent a lot of time clarifying with the help of a coach and mentor, the qualities and characteristics of the kind of person I wanted to be in a committed relationship with. When feelings of love and passion began to emerge with my new partner, Jake, I knew those feelings had come up not because Jake was the right partner, but because I was consciously choosing to see him in him the qualities I most wanted in a partner. So David, Sophia continued, let me ask you again. Can you think of a time in which passion or desire arose naturally aside from the early stages of a relationship? Take a few minutes and look back over your life. I remembered my first job out of college right after I finished college. I got a really exciting job helping to build a public access cable television studio in operation. We built the whole thing with our own hands. I trained volunteers how to use video equipment and edit programs. We had in-studio programs to educate and reach out to the public. We taped area events and we all felt that we were helping to build real community. We won national awards for our efforts. 
I would wake up every morning eager to get to work, to begin the day's new creations. It didn't pay much, but it was one of the most fun and exciting jobs I've ever had. Sophia smiled and said, if you could only see your eyes right now, David, your lights are on and burning brightly. That's how passion looks and feels in the creator orientation. When you tap that passion to create the outcomes that matter to you, it provides powerful energy to take action toward your heart's desires, said Ted. The behavior that moves you in that direction is taking baby steps. Taking a baby step means doing the next logical thing in front of you, making a phone call, having a conversation, or gathering information. Each step you take either moves you closer to your vision or helps you clarify the final form of your desired outcome. Ted wrote baby steps in the last circle. It is the baby steps you take that everyday things you do that eventually lead to the manifestation of your outcome. That makes sense, I said. I did that same thing again and again when I worked in the cable television studio. I used to love the editing process. We'd usually record more than twice the amount of footage we would need for a final videotape, and then I'd sit in the editing room for hours putting the program together, one scene at a time, like a video jigsaw puzzle. I never thought of calling it baby steps, but that is definitely the process we were using to produce TV programs. Three big differences. Whether you're creating a television program, building a house, or beginning a new relationship, the basic process is the same, Sophia said. The creator orientation is a powerful and simple, although not always easy, way to think and act. It has become very important to me, thanks to Ted. You're welcome, Sophia, Ted smiled. There is definitely a different air about you since you've adopted the creator orientation. I can assure you, David, that people who know you will soon begin to notice a different air about you too. If you commit to the creator orientation as your primary stance in life, Ted's hinting at the three things that make the difference between the victim and the creator orientation, Sophia added chuckling. Ted, stop being a goofball and tell David what air stands for. Ted winked at me. His smile activated little creases in his face and his eyes glistened. Air stands for three big differences between the victim and creator stances. The first is where you place your attention. As the victim, your focus is on what you don't want. You think, speak, and act on the problems in your life. As creator, your place, you place your attention first and foremost on what you do want, your envisioned outcome. The second difference is your intention. In the victim orientation, your intention is to get rid of or away from your problems. In the creator orientation, your intention is to bring into being or manifest the outcomes you envision. The third big difference is the results you produce. The results of the victim orientation are temporarily and reactive or temporary and reactive. With the creator orientation though, you're much more likely to produce satisfying, sustainable results over time. With each baby step you take from the creator stance, you come closer to or get clearer about your heart's desires. Sophia chimed in, don't think that Ted's saying the creator orientation is all sweetness and light or that there's no such thing as a problem. I can tell you from experience that living from the creator orientation is actually more challenging. In the victim orientation, I didn't have to exercise conscious choice. I just reacted to my circumstances. The creator orientation requires considering and choosing my response to everything that happens, taking many, many baby steps that eventually lead to manifesting my envisioned outcome. And in the process, problems certainly do come up. Ted continued, in the creator orientation, however, you cultivate the capacity to choose which problems get your attention. You select problems that will best serve your outcomes, and those are the only problems you actively work to solve. It's important to know that even when you adopt the creator orientation, you'll still experience anxiety at times. As Sophia said so well, the creator orientation is not all sweetness and light. Anxiety and fear are a natural and normal process of our experience. Creators, however, 
learn how to move forward in their lives with courage in the face of fear and anxiety. And there are no guarantees. Often you won't know whether your heart's desires are attainable until after you've put in a great deal of time, effort, and experimentation to make your envisioned outcome a reality. Sophia added, after Dan and I had been apart for a while, I eventually chose to be open to another intimate relationship. As I began dating, exploring what I wanted in a relationship, I came up against a lot of fear and anxiety. Sometimes I thought the conscious co-creative bond I was hoping for was just a romantic fantasy. I dated a number of men before I met Jake. Each person I met and each experience I had while I was dating helped me get clearer about the kind of relationship I wanted. A flock of pelicans flew along the shoreline just a few feet above the surf. And as I followed their flight, I wondered how long it would be before I was willing and ready to be open to a new relationship. I shuddered at the thought. I also felt a twinge of sadness as I realized I was much more certain about what I didn't want in my life than I was about what I wanted to create. Where to begin? My mind was abuzz with questions. I buried my hands in my pockets and tried to make sense of it all. I think I understand the idea of baby steps, taking the creating process one step at a time, I said, but how do you figure out which steps to take? How do you know where to start? Where do I place my focus? Sophia gave my arm a gentle squeeze. I remember so well what a jumble of questions came up when I saw how different it might be to take the creator approach to my life. About that time, I came across a wonderful passage from a letter that the great poet Rilke wrote to a younger poet he had taken under his wing. Sophia reached into her beach bag and pulled out a journal which appeared to be well-worn. She opened the journal and looked for a particular page. This is what Rilke said. Be patient toward all that is unsolved in your heart and try to love the questions themselves like locked rooms and like books that are written in a very foreign tongue. Do not now seek the answers which cannot be given you because you would not be able to live them. And the point is to live everything. Live the questions now. Perhaps you will then gradually, without noticing, live along some distant day into the answer. A small sailboat bobbed out on the waves, its bright sails billowing with the sea breeze, drifting gently, serenely on the water. Give yourself plenty of time in coming to the answers for yourself, Sophia said warmly. It takes time and a lot of introspection and soul searching to get clear about what you really want to manifest in your life. People will begin to show up who will help you focus and sharpen your envisioned outcomes. In fact, Ted invited me to meet you so I could offer my support as you learn to live in the creator orientation. Others helped me to learn and I'd be glad to help you if you want my support. As I took in Sophia's kind offer, I looked out at the ocean to mark the sailboat's progress. The wind was up and the boat's sails were stretched tight and full. I wondered if such a small craft could sustain the pressure of so much force and speed. The crew scrambled about on deck, adjusting the rigging. I just hoped they knew what they were doing. See you next time for Chapter 7.